Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. I read an interesting article this week that I want to talk about with you, Adam. The Department of Homeland Security and Infrastructure Security Agency, the CISA, released an analysis where they talked about their findings from their risk and vulnerability assessments, RVAs, they're called, that were conducted over the fiscal year of 2020. They had 37 total RVAs that were conducted across multiple stakeholders, across various sectors, and what they did was they aligned the results with the MITRE attack framework. And if you're not familiar with what an RVA is, when CISA conducts an RVA, they collect data using on-site assessments, and then they combine them with national threat and vulnerability information. And when they're done, they have a findings report where they provide actionable remediation recommendations where they're prioritized by risk. So what was interesting about this article, and then I went and actually read the findings report from CISA, which I'll put a link in the show notes. It's pretty extensive, but very, very informational, and we'll kind of talk through that. But they broke down percentages of what attack vector were successful in each one of the MITRE attack framework components. So, for example, for initial access, the officials found that phishing attacks and phishing links were 49% of how most of the attackers were able to get access, initial access to the organization. After that, were public-facing applications, so some sort of application with RDP or SSH or some sort of open port with a vulnerability that was open to the internet. 9.8% was phishing attachments, not to be confused with the links themselves, but then you know the user actually downloaded an attachment and launched some sort of executable. For execution, so actually running something on the system for initial access, PowerScript Shell was 24% followed by WMI, which is Windows Management Instrumentation, was 13%, and then some sort of command and scripting interpreter was 12.2%. By far, PowerShell was a quarter of that. So for privilege escalations, most of the time they were using valid accounts, which was 37% of the time, followed by privilege escalation uh, with an exploit, which was 21%. And then... Interesting enough, 15% of privilege escalation was impersonating tokens. So for lateral movement, attackers primarily used pass the hash, which was close to 30% of the total um, number of ways that they could get in, followed by RDP at 25%, and then some sort of exploitation of remote services at 12%. So I just found the numbers really, really interesting. You know, we've talked about, Adam, on the show about phishing and that being um, one of the largest methods of uh, getting into an organization. We've also talked about impersonating tokens. We talked about Windows Defender Credential Guard, which protects against past the hash. So these numbers kind of match up, but it's still interesting to me that they were so high on how the attackers during the RVA were able to compromise the organization. Yeah, I think a lot of this data lines up with our expectations, but it's still interesting to see it spelled out so clearly. So 60% when you combine the 50 and the 10% were some sort of phishing, whether it's an attachment or in a malicious link. So that is still your absolute number one vector to prevent compromise in your environment is to harden your email environment. Make sure you have a really, really good 
email hygiene solution and make sure you're also training your users regularly on that, which feels like a bit of a dead horse at times, but this is why you can, you can never stop continuing to push this effort. I, I had somebody on a, on a team of mine here at Microsoft who recently just received a, a phishing test internally. And they actually turned to me and asked like, Hey, is this legit or is this, you know, not, and this is a person who is a security seller. And, and so even people who do this for a living can sometimes be fooled by these. And that's why constant training and, and constant effort is so important here. I think a couple of the other interesting things you highlighted past the hash used in 30% of instances. So that's where we talked about credential guard a couple of weeks ago can help you prevent that almost a third of lateral movement exercises by the bad guys. There's a tool that can do that. And, and if you own windows enterprise, then you already own that. Um, also was interesting that 30, it was about 38% of the privilege escalation is done using valid accounts. That's where it's really important to have a tool in place that does things like alert for anomalous activity on a user account. If a user account is used at a suspicious time of day or used to access a suspicious system, it's not normally used to gain access to, you should have alerting on that as well, because otherwise, how are you going to know something's going on when it's a legitimate user account? That's kind of the only way to get detected. So there's a lot of options out there to alert you to these really high percentage attacks. Because if we kind of put this all together, generally speaking, the bad guys are going to get in through email. They're going to gain lateral movement through past the hash, and they're going to use an account that already exists in your environment. So when we get all carried away with things, worrying about zero days and worrying about exploits and all these things. Yes, those are methods the bad guys use, but the primary ones are the known attack methods where there's really good mitigations available to you. So that's something that stood out to me, Andy, as you kind of went through that initial kind of reading of the the data. Yeah. And we might be beating a dead horse. There may be a lot of people who listen to this show who are thinking, well, this is basic stuff, but I talked to a customer this week that, you know, they were looking at an EDR solution and I asked them about some of their other security defenses and i asked them if they had a secure email gateway like a proof point or a mimecast an office uh, microsoft defender for office and they didn't but they were looking at edr and so that to me was a big red flag and i thought well this is something that you should get into place first before you even look at an edr solution so again maybe basic but there are people out there and if you're one of those companies that you're looking at different solutions, but you don't even have a, an advanced email security gateway. That is something that I would highly, highly recommend and prioritize to get into place right away. The other thing is for phishing, you know, we've talked about how you should have an internal phishing program or something like that, that simulates that. I, I see a lot of flack on Twitter about people getting, phishing emails and and getting shamed for it. And I think what's important in part of your phishing program is have empathy when you are conducting those phishing programs. You don't want to shame your users. It's all about educating them. And if it is a legit email, respond in a way to say, hey, you know, this is legit. This is why it's legit. Give them a, a, a professional answer. And if they accidentally click on something, it's not something that you should be sharing around the office and be like, hey, so-and-so clicked on this. Like, you know, give them a chance and, and kind of explain to them. But punishing your users is really not a way to go when it comes to a phishing campaign. So that that's my two cents on that. Well, you're, you're backed up by psychology on that where – positive reinforcement works better than negative reinforcement. So one of the things I like recently, again, my experience here at Microsoft is when they do an internal phishing um, campaign or test, when you correctly flag it and use the report message tool, you get a positive reinforcement email that says, Hey, good job. You caught the phishing, you know, attempt and you properly reported it to us. That little like add a boy, that little bit of positive reinforcement, we know from psychology works better than negative reinforcement, the fear of failure, the fear of doing anything wrong. 
And I have heard the most extreme example I've heard is organizations where it was literally one strike and you're fired phishing policies. I've heard of organizations because customers have told me this where they had a policy that if you got failed a phishing test or, you know, worse yet, a real one, you had to write an apology letter to the whole company, like public shaming. And I was a frankly appalled at, at both of those philosophies, because we know again from psychology that that's not as effective as simple positive reinforcement. So, and, and also to the people on Twitter who sometimes get upset that security organizations do it. We covered this on a past show where, where perhaps it wasn't done in the best way because it was kind of tricking people to see like what their potential bonus was. But then again, the bad guys will do that. Or when a lot of it came out early in the pandemic, a lot of COVID related items. Again, sometimes, you know, the bad guys are going to use any methodology possible. So we as defenders have to, again, try to show as much empathy as possible, but we have to be realistic and make our attempts look like the bad ones might. And the data just backs this up. 60% of that initial access comes through phishing, comes through email. So this is something that you talk about bang for your buck. You talk about return on investment. You're not going to get it anything better than this. So, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about this. And I think a theme as we go through today, Andy, is going to be the basics. Because when we kind of talked about this before we went on the air, we, I, I observed, I'm like, man, this is, this is some basic stuff. But it, it goes out to the fact that, hey, I sell security tools, Andy sells security tools, and we'd love for customers to buy lots of tools. But ultimately, we'd love for you to be secure too. And sometimes being secure is all about the basics first. Before you go buy that EDR solution, which is for post-breach investigation, which is super fun and geeky, you need to do protective efforts that deliver a lot of return on investment, and that's like email hygiene. So lots of good stuff here, and I think we're going to have even more conversations as we go through this document from CISA. So I reviewed the entire document and what I picked out for our topic of conversation today is what CISA gave as recommendations for mitigations to each one of the MITRE attack uh, framework items. So this is not going to be an exhaustive list. It's just going to be some of the ones that I thought were interesting that I want to highlight And again, some of them may be basic, but I think it is important. So under initial access, which is the first part of the MITRE framework, controlling execution through allowed application lists. So I thought this was interesting mainly because not everybody has an application control program, you know, whether it's doing it through Windows Defender application control or through a third party like Carbon Black. Uh, I've seen that before, you know. For me, I think it's pretty difficult for normal users to have that control being exerted over them. Where I do think this type of mitigation is important are on standard kiosk computers. So if it's a standardized build and it's always going to be the same, well, there's no reason why you should allow any type of applications to be executed other than the ones that it's designed to be executed on. So... Think about it, at least for those, if you have a standardized user, like say, like a call center or something like that, where all the machines are going to be the same, they're running the same applications, then yes, for sure, you know, lock down local admin, lock down the applications that can be installed on it. So definitely one of those. Disabling macros, I also thought this was important. We always talk about how macros can be executed on office documents and there's actually a setting within config.office.com. And that's something that we haven't really talked about, but that is actually a cloud version of how you can configure your office clients so that if you allow your users to install office on something else and you're not deploying it through an XML file through the configurator, you can actually configure cloud policies that wherever they sign in using their office account, that those security policies will be pulled down and implemented. And one of them is disabling macros from office documents that are downloaded from the internet. So, you know, that's something that can be implemented. I think sometimes I have encountered this where as security professionals, we want to implement something like we know this is bad, but then at the same time, 
when it happens, you find out there's actually users who are using macros in your environment. So you have to try to maybe make it a continuous process, educate the business and help them migrate off of whatever they're doing. Like, why are you using macros? Okay, we can't use them anymore because we want to disable them. Or if it's business critical, make it an exception. One of the other ones is, you know, identify vulnerabilities through patching. So both having a vulnerability management program and, of course, patching. Training your users for suspicious emails. We talked about that. And then utilizing a cloud service for your email. So by all means, try to migrate to a cloud solution, whether it be Microsoft or Google. It's much better to do that than to host your own exchange server. As we've discovered, there have been several exchange vulnerabilities. So I think I read something pretty extreme on one of the Twitter um, tweets that I saw, which was basically the only people who should be running on-prem exchange is Microsoft. Because obviously we run Microsoft (laughs) Exchange Mm -hmm. on our servers to host Office 365. But... Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's the list for initial access. What do you, what do you think about that, Adam? So the allowed application lists and disabling macros, like hard things to do, right? But you should deploy them in as many scenarios as you possibly can. Macros, again, you could deploy for most of the users in your organization. If you have a specific set of users where that's just not tenable, you have still reduced your risk surface by that. You can also look into something called um, Application Guard, which is now available for the Office client and exists in addition to the Edge browser. So we haven't talked about this a lot in the show yet. I think we will in a future Windows security episode. But Application Guard is where we use that hypervisor-based security model that we talked about for Credential Guard to actually run the edge browser or the office client in an isolated instance that's um, isolated from the rest of the operating system through that hypervisor based security. And I don't know if that runs macros or not, but it's still kind of a, in the same vein here where you can potentially um, prevent unknown office documents from executing um, outside of basically that, that somewhat sandboxed instance of the office client. But in general, with all of these things, don't, go a hundred percent or nothing, get what you can. And, and I think we all recognize that we'll put these out there or CISA will put them out there and, and they're ideal if you can swing it, but at the same time, anything's better than nothing for, for some of these um, options as well. And with the cloud service provider for email in particular, yes, I, I saw those same tweets basically saying nobody should be running exchange on premises anymore. Only Microsoft should. Uh, but The other thing to consider too is at the very least having that front end for email filtering. Again, Andy, you mentioned the the usual suspects here, Mimecast, Proofpoint, Defender for Office 365. The other benefit of a cloud service for any sort of security offering like this, whether it's Microsoft or one of those other solutions, is that they have that cloud scale. And so cloud scale means they can implement security solutions once and all customers benefit from them. So you get very, very, very rapid response, but also you have visibility that even if an attack hasn't hit your organization yet, if it's been recognized in one of the other customers, you get shared protection essentially. So it it's kind of that rising tide lifts all ships kind of model where by being part of a larger cloud offering, when anybody gets under attack and that attack is recognized and mitigated, then you all benefit from it. And that's just something that it, it seems counterintuitive because you remember when it was, well, is the cloud secure enough to use? Now it's become the cloud is a security imperative because that sharing of telemetry and protection and data and, and all of those benefits benefits you as an organization, because if you're trying to roll it on your own, if you're trying to do your own thing, you just don't have the visibility, the telemetry and the signal to be as proactive blocking attacks for your organization. So it's interesting to see CISA call this out so distinctly, but they have, they have started to, in, in several instances, 
downright recommend cloud services. There's another document that came out, um, and I think it was the NSA who published that one, but they had literally recommended, like, don't use ADFS anymore, use Azure Active Directory. And their guidance was coming from the same thought process that having a global scale identity solution gives you more protection than trying to roll your own and protect your organization against identity attacks all by yourself without that benefit of cloud intelligence. So I think that's where that comes from. And, and I think that touches on, on most of these um, pieces of guidance here, obviously patching, patching, patching. I know we're sick of talking about it, but still important, still something you have to do as well. So when it comes to command and control, they talk about preventing applications from storing credential data and then changing default usernames and passwords. And I think, User account management and password hygiene are both obviously important things. So you shouldn't store passwords in documents or text files. You know, there were several of these actually included CISA calling out saying that you should scan regularly for files using some sort of DLP solution to see if you have passwords that are being stored in files on file shares or in the cloud. So Obviously, you know, train your users, get some sort of password vault. It, it sucks and it's very hard to implement. There's, there's a lot of education that's involved when it comes to password vault, but that is going to be better. Or you could use something built in like the Edge browser, which is tied to your Azure AD account. So when you sync it with your Azure AD, at least that data stays within your environment and then you can scope conditional access policies around it. We've talked about for browser security, where if you use like the Chrome browser, well, users will sign into their personal Gmail, save passwords to that, and then exfiltrate those passwords. So password hygiene, still very important. There's a lot to unpack there, but know that you, you shouldn't be changing the default passwords, the default usernames, and obviously scanning for those. Periodic review for user and application privilege level, and uh, their authorized unauthorized grants of elevated privilege so this is also again something that should be done and is very hard to implement you want to do audits of your user accounts to take a look at what users are what user accounts have access to as far as administrative privileges on machines applications within active directory cloud applications, admin portals, you know, those sorts of things and controlling who can create those things. So in one of my investigations, which was actually brought up from a user, we discovered that there was a service account. It was actually a general service account that was being used for multiple applications. And this was an AD account that had zero MFA enabled on it so because it's just pure AD. And because that app service account was being used across the board, if that were, account were to get compromised, multiple um, production services would be brought down. So we've talked about AD security in one of our oldest podcast episodes, but what was important I'm going to just kind of mention now is that you should have purpose built service accounts. What you shouldn't do is use multiple service accounts or multiple security groups for multiple services. Oh, we have a security group for this. Oh, we have a service account for this. We'll just use that. It's obviously easier to do that, but don't be lazy. Make another service account, store that credential in your vault and have it for that specific purpose because that's defense in depth. If one account gets compromised, it's not going to compromise another account. But if you have one account for all these things and that gets compromised, well, you've now been owned across the board. Configure firewalls with granular ingress and egress rules. You know, one of the things that at my previous organization that I really, really was happy with was that just by default, we did not allow anything inbound. So all inbound initiated traffic from the internet was blocked by default. And it was very, very hard to get an exception. If there was an exception, it had to be extremely granular. Like 
from this IP address on this port, you can have inbound traffic initiated. So be very, very cognizant of what you allow through your firewall. And I would say, you know, put your foot down. Like unless it is a absolute necessary service for the company, you shouldn't really allow anything inbound. And then utilize web proxies. So at my previous company, we use Zscaler, which is a great product, and there's other ones out there. But CISA recommends that you use some sort of web proxy in order to prevent or limit the use of external services, web services, which basically means filter. You should be filtering your, your web traffic. So I think you know there's other products that compete with Zscaler, like Palo Alto, um, there's other ones as well, but definitely should look at some sort of web proxy because of how much we spend on the internet and how much time your users are going to all these different websites. There should be something to just help you filter out the malicious stuff. So a lot here from C2 mitigation measures on the first item, Andy, you were talking about like storing credential data, having credential data stored. Uh, you could also have API keys that are stored or stuff like that. And and you kind of took more of the user facing perspective, but this also applies to app dev as well. So when we talk about application security and our friend Tanya Jenka, who joined us on the show, who literally wrote the book, Alison Bob Learn Application Security, you should check it out. Uh, she talks about this in the book that you should do regular code reviews to look for stored secrets that are in application code, and you should remove them out. There should instead be some sort of call out to an external service or some sort of security module like Azure Key Vault, where that secret is retrieved only at that specific time and used. And that way, if the secret changes, it's also beneficial. You don't have to go and change any of your code. It's more secure and it's better. So you don't want any sort of shared secret put in code and text files and anything else. So you should be scanning for those. Absolutely. Uh, from a scanning privilege and user privilege and application privilege, you need an identity governance program. Now, admittedly, that's, that's a tall ask, but it's something you can start with. You can draw a line in the sand and say, moving forward, when we create a new group or a new distribution list or whatever, we're going to set up some sort of annual quarterly semi-annual review for that group and its membership moving forward, or we're going to start reviewing who has global admin in our Office 365 tenant. Those sorts of things need to start happening as well. And then you should also be able to recognize like, hey, somebody just got put in a privileged group that does not belong there. So having tools like Defender for Identity that will alert you if a user gets put in a privileged group is helpful as well. Configuring firewalls, you touched on that pretty clearly, Andy, but that's one of those examples where that's totally in our control. That's something we as information security professionals can drive toward, and it's just hard because you have to get the application vendor to give you a comprehensive list of all of the ports and IP ranges and everything else that's used by the application. And you have to spend time to fine tune it, and it's a lot of effort, but my goodness, is it worth it? And I'll admit, I was kind of on the other side of this at one point where I felt like that's paranoid security. But anymore, you can't be too careful, and all of these steps help. And so that's a good step to take, too. And that's totally in the control of almost anyone on this uh, listening to this podcast, because practically every organization has at least some basic capability to do network filtering. That's so fundamental. So there's no cost. There's no licensing. There's no anything. It's just a matter of effort. And if there's one thing you control with all of this, well, two things you can control. It's your attitude and your effort. You can always control those two things. And so this is an example where with the right attitude and the right effort, you can harden your environment, no money required. Uh, limiting the use of external web services, sure, yeah. I mean, if it's not business related, you know, you might not want to allow access to it. I mean, this is where the security side of me and the productivity slash user experience side kind of butt heads. Um, obviously extremely low value or potentially dangerous websites should be inaccessible from your corporate devices, but I tend to err on the side of people don't work a pure eight hour day straight through like a robot without any breaks or without any diversions. And so allowing somebody to do, you know, a quick side task or something, uh, 
put in a grocery store order or check their email or something might not be a big deal. It depends on your risk appetite and everything else. But I'm a little more liberal in the use of this policy than, than some of our peers in InfoSec, because I think there's that balance of, sure, you want to harden the environment, but you also don't want to make it feel like you are a robot who is here to do this one task. And that's the only thing you're allowed to do because that's just not how human beings operate. So I'm a little, a little more squishy there. Again, I follow my rule for that type of enforcement on how would I like to use the device as usually my gut feeling and, and how I would roll with different categories. So when it comes to malicious sites, obviously block those, uh, Peer to peer traffic, you probably don't need that, right? You don't Napster or Kazaa back <laughs> in the day, um, and uh, you know stuff like um, gambling. You know that's usually a category, and that can go either way. Like some people don't care. Some HR companies, departments don't care if they go to gambling or firearms or violence or political things. I mean, those are all things that you can limit as a company. But for sure, the security things like you shouldn't be allowing Tor, you shouldn't be allowing BitTorrent, that sort of stuff. So, um, so moving on, lateral movement. You know, we kind of touched on this, but they talk about limiting credential overlap across systems, and they use LAPS as a an example, and that's definitely something we'd recommend. So, a lot of people have a service desk where they have an administrator password service desk and and then a password that is added as a local admin to all of your systems, or it's the same on different systems as well. You do want to limit that as much as possible. Laps is a great solution to implement so that you have a rotating password on the back end. You don't want to allow users to be local admins on multiple systems. You know, we've talked about this as well. Local admins again is one of those things where it can be difficult for users who are high functioning and have a lot of applications that they need to install developers, it folks, but your general users probably don't need local admin and local admin on servers. You know, that should be limited as well to just the server admins or an application admin for that specific server. So even for an application admin, do they really need local admin? Are they actually installing anything? Because again, local admin on any type of OS is going to have access to everything. So if that user were to get compromised, then that server is an entry point. So what we did at my previous organization or what I was trying to do and and move towards is even for server access, you would have to have a privileged account to have local admin so at least you have that separation, your day-to-day user that you're getting emails on, that you're clicking the links. That's your normal user that you don't perform any type of administrative access. If you need to RDP to a server, you need to have local admin, it's going to be a privileged account. So make sure that you have that separation. Using multi-factor authentication for remote sessions, I thought this was interesting because it is pretty difficult nowadays to have MFA for RDP or any type of remote services unless it's cloud hosted. So that I think that that may be difficult to implement, but that's one of the recommendations. They also talk about disabling RDP uh, completely if it is unnecessary. So that is also interesting. If it's just a server that's running a service, maybe you can get to it through command line or something else, but they recommend turning it off. They talk about using host-based firewall rules to limit host-to-host traffic. And I thought that was interesting as well because I think a lot of times a lot of people take the easy way out and they grant elevated privileges because it's an easy button. Like, for example, when you need a service account that has privileged access to something well, it's certainly really easy to just put them into the domain admins group and they have the access. Today I was spinning up my lab and I needed to add a service account for AD Sync. Well, AD Sync requires certain privileges in order to actually perform that sync to Azure Active Directory. I've seen a lot of times where people just add that user, that service account, to the domain admin group. 
But in reality, they only need certain privileges, and it documents all of that in the support docs for AD Sync. So take a few moments, and it may take a little bit longer to granularly scope out those permissions. But again, you're reducing that risk overall. And that's the same thing with firewalls. Sometimes it's easy just to allow all or put in a firewall rule and just be done with it. Whereas, for example, SCCM requires a list of host-based rules on the server in order to allow the SCCM server to talk to clients. Well, take the time to add those rules in there. It's very, very long. It's a long list and it's documented, but it's much better to have a granular specific list to allow those connections than to just say, let's just go ahead and allow all. And then finally, to talk about application isolating, sandbox techniques, um, network segmentation. This one is also pretty tough. I think a lot of days networking is deprioritized when it comes to information security because we're moving to a zero trust environment. And a lot of information security professionals that are coming out and are new to the to the industry are not as strong in networking. But it is important to understand the basics and work with your networking team, your network engineers, to implement network segmentation. And that means segmenting off resources into privileged sections so that normal users and normal machines can't talk to them and that you have to be on a ACL and access control list with a specific IP or a specific user in order to even traverse into that subnet. So a little bit more complicated architecture, but certainly worth your time, especially when it comes to um, services and servers and applications that are sensitive to the organization and keeping them off the main network. There's a lot to unpack here on our lateral movement segment. We did talk about credential guard earlier on the show, so we don't need to repeat that. One thing that's interesting to me here, and you know what? There's not always going to be total agreement on everything. We can agree on a lot of things like you should do as much MFA as possible. Totally agree. However, I will, I will nitpick one thing here. I do not like MFA solutions that in any way modify or change the Windows operating system because what you are adding is additional attack surface to the Windows operating system compared to a piece that is hardened and tested repeatedly. And now you are at the whim of another party who is now responsible for hardening the authentication mechanism there. So when it says things like, use multi-factor authentication for remote management sessions. Sometimes that's really, really hard to do because those components are hard-coded. Now, you can actually do a type of multi-factor authentication for remote desktop in particular. It actually supports Windows Hello in certain scenarios. And the way you do this is essentially you set it so that it requires smart card to log in, and Windows Hello is essentially kind of a virtual smart card. Anyhow, this is in the weeds, but there are ways to do some of this. But what I do not agree with is like don't buy some third-party solution just because it lets you bolt on MFA to a certain sign-in attempt, and it's modifying the Windows operating system. Um, we'll agree to disagree here with CISA because I think that introduces more attack surface than it provides benefit. Um, One man's opinion, but just for what it's worth. Um, For some of the other things that you talked about in here, I don't think I have a whole lot to add on to them other than talking about limiting credential overlap among systems. Kind of an add-on here to think about. And this is guidance that came from Microsoft in the wake of the Solora gate situation. The guidance has become, you should not use a synchronized identity to have privileged access in the cloud. So if you do some sort of privileged account, or even if we're still, you just have a regular account and that's an active directory account. So let's say Andy jaw. Um, and then you sync that to the cloud and you give that same Andy jaw account privileges in the cloud. Now you have opportunity to, if I can somehow 
compromise Andy's password. Maybe I, I can crack it offline, you know, using um, one of those brute force tools against Active Directory, or maybe you still run ADFS and I can compromise your secrets and forge a token and gain access to the cloud that way. It opens up a lot of additional opportunity to take that known identity on premises and then compromise the cloud identity as well. So the current guidance is any privileged identity in the Microsoft cloud, whether that's Azure AD or Microsoft 365 or anywhere else should be solely cloud only. That account should not have an on-premises equivalent at all. It should be only a cloud identity. And of course it should have a separate password. Um, but that way you, you've completely eliminated a lateral movement path just because I've compromised your on-premises network in some way. Doesn't mean I have a path to forge tokens, uh, crack passwords offline or do anything else that can potentially get me to your cloud service as well. And now I have even more area to run amok. So that's a good tip and something that's relatively straightforward to do because hopefully you don't have that many admins in your Microsoft cloud environment or any third-party cloud for that matter. And you can just go to those admins and say, hey, we're going to stop syncing your privileged account. We're going to stand up a cloud-only account, and you're going to set the password, and you're going to use that moving forward. That should not be terribly burdensome for you to do, and it's a pretty quick win that destroys a lateral movement path from on-prem to the cloud. Yeah, I bet a lot of organizations out there have domain admins that are synced to Azure AD, and then you use those credentials for global admin or something equivalent in another identity provider. Mm -hmm. So definitely, as Adam said, per the current guidance is to separate those. Mm -hmm. Your domain admin should be a on-prem identity only, and then anything else would be a cloud identity. So for privileged escalation, this is a basic one, but it's worth mentioning. Update software applications regularly. And that means having an inventory of your software and making sure that you are actually updating them. A good example could be browsers. It could be your PDF reader like Adobe Acrobat, which a lot of people use. And how many people deploy those through SCCM and then push out updates because they're afraid of breaking something. I mean, it is just as important to update your applications as well as the operating system. And I, I can't count the number of times that I've logged into a server somewhere and someone has installed Notepad++ or they've installed Chrome or they've installed Adobe Acrobat. And those applications have no place on a server. Like you should not be installing those on a server. The server should be as clean as possible. And if you do, do install those as part of whatever you need on the server, then they should be updated as well. And you should have a vulnerability management solution that regularly looks for not only OS vulnerabilities, but application vulnerabilities as well. Limiting user permissions to create tokens. Now, this one I thought was interesting as well because when it comes to creating API tokens, sometimes people just grant the developers the ability to pull their own API tokens and use them. When I was at my previous organization, we limited that. So if you needed an API token, you had to get someone from security to create it. And we would, there would have to be a documented request for it. And then we would provide the API token and with a certain expiration date if needed as well. So that, again, should be limited. It's least privileged, which is another thing that CISA talks about is implementing least privilege. So only the security folks at my previous company were able to create API tokens and not just giving it out to a bunch of developers to create their own. And that mainly is is if their account gets compromised then of course they can create api tokens or the attackers can create api tokens and then compromise other applications as well so uh this last one we we already kind of talked about it but limiting privileged um elevated privileged access to 
application. So again, for privilege escalation, it kind of makes sense to limit as much as possible the permissions for service accounts users to the least privileged model. I, I, at the top of the show, we talked about some of this is going to be basic stuff and it is. And I think this highlights as we've gone through all of this guidance that the basics still really matter. You can have all the whiz bang tools in the world, but if you're not updating your software, you're, you're opening yourself to a host of problems, update your software applications regularly. I'd like to advocate for in general, switching your mental model on this, as opposed to in a, an approval based model where we explicitly approve every patch that goes out, unless you literally have the time to test and evaluate that patch thoroughly, you should move to a deny based model where patches flow out on a regular basis to larger and larger and larger sets of users. And you have basically a mechanism to stop that deployment if, and, or when you encounter a problem as you've slowly expanded the scope of it because that's how it really gets tested. Not having a bunch of IT guys install it and run it for three days and say, oh, it's good. You know, if you instead have some sort of representative sample of users throughout your org and they get it for a week before it goes out to this first wave of users and so on, you have a much better opportunity of testing it in the real world and then evaluating if there's problems. And if there's no problems, nobody has to do anything because you've kind of automated that process. So I'm talking about kind of deployment rings model for patching, but I strongly encourage you, unless you are actually doing some sort of deep investigation into each and every single patch, which um, share some of that budget with the rest of the world, if you, you have a team to actually do that, you should move away from an allow model to a deny model with patching because patches should just happen unless you discover a problem. So strongly, strongly, strongly encourage that. And I'll get on my soapbox for a second. Browsers in particular have to be patched. Again, and we did another show about this, but you talk about an application that loads remote code, remote images, and does that all day long with untrusted data sources. That's literally what a web browser does. You need to trust that is as up-to-date and as hardened as possible. And if organizations or departments of your org need an exception to that, it is as limited as possible. And you have really, really, really done your homework on explaining the risk to the business because the risk for that is frankly massive. And so patching browsers, super duper important. Uh, everything else here, I think you already touched on Andy, um, least privilege, periodical review. So we already touched on like identity governance perspective, like reviewing who your global admins are, who your domain admins are. Yes, do that. But also, here's where you earn that money from your SIM solution because you're ingesting your audit logs into that, right? And you've created a query that runs on a regular basis that looks for privilege escalation, right? And so you are making that SIM earn its money and delivering that report on, here is everything I saw in the audit log related to privilege escalation or users being granted additional privilege, like privilege grants. And that should be something that happens automatically on a regular basis. And a human being is reviewing that and looking for anything anomalous in it as well. So kind of in that same token, we already talked about doing it from an identity perspective, but also just looking for it from an audit log perspective as well. Yeah, that's a good call out, Adam. At my previous org, we used a product called Stealth Bits, which has some, a few different products, but one of them was uh, an alert type product where you can tie it into your active directory and then anytime something happens you can then get an alert on it one example was i'd always get an email whenever anyone checked the box for password does not expire now we do have obviously different guidance on whether or not passwords were are supposed to expire or not but at our at that org we had a rule where passwords were supposed to expire every six months so anytime someone checked that off we would audit that and then if it was an actual user account because a lot of surface accounts that's fine you you, you create a very complex password you check the box where password does not expire you move on you store that password somewhere but for user accounts we didn't want that because users would set a very easy password and then never change it for six seven years so anytime that happened, it would come across and I'd get 
an alert. Same thing with I had alerts for whenever someone else added a user to the domain admin group or the enterprise admin group. And anytime that happened, I'd ping them and be like, hey, I see this. What's going on? So, you know, if that, there wasn't a request that came through, because of course, anyone who's a domain admin can make another domain admin. So you need to have what Adam is talking about, some sort of report or rule that is running constantly so you can review that. And you mentioned SIM, Adam. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning of the show, we talked about EDR. And those are post-breach tools. And so exfiltration is the last part of the MITRE attack framework. That is when something's already happened and they're trying to exfiltrate data. And so part of the Gartner tripod for post-breach tools is, number one, SIM, number two, EDR, and then number three is something that they call an NDR. So one of the things that CISA talks about here is deploying a network IDS IPS to alert or stop sort of traffic, known malware, that sort of stuff. And that's kind of a basic thing. A lot of firewalls have that built in already. If you're using a web proxy, that's also going to stop it. But an NDR, a network detection and response tool, something like um, a dark trace or um, there's a few other ones that compete with dark trace as well. I can't remember all of them off the top of my head right now, but those are either sensors or appliances, virtual or physical that you would place in line with your network that would inspect traffic as well. And what's good about that is it, it will inspect not only stuff that has an agent on it, like maybe you already have an EDR solution and you're saying, okay, I already have all the stuff, but it'll inspect IoT devices. It'll inspect other network devices. It'll inspect all the network traffic that is happening along your network. And so having that is key in the post-breach trifecta, as Gartner would put it. So, you know, if you were to rank the tools as far as what you have, for sure I would prioritize having an EDR because users are probably going to be the most susceptible to having some sort of breach and then it would depend on your company after that like if you have a lot of iot devices if you're a very industrial organization maybe you prioritize an ndr over a sim or maybe if you're just mostly traditional and in the office okay then go for a sim but an ndr should be something that you would consider later on so I have that as a call out here. Make sure that you have some sort of network detection involved as part of your post breach. Another interesting call out here on the CISO recommendation is that they actually said to implement SSL decryption for web proxies. And I've never seen this documented anywhere. And I know that among the security community, we often debate whether or not you should decrypt your traffic via SSL because sometimes Vendors will downgrade the encryption when they go and essentially man in the middle all of your own traffic. You're installing a certificate of that vendor that decrypts the traffic and then re-encrypts it and puts it back. And you can have issues with applications that do certificate pinning like OneDrive or Dropbox or something like that as a client on your desktop that you have to actually add as an exception. And it does cause a lot of issues. But... CISA's specifically calling out here to say, hey, you should do this because in their document, they showed that 68% of exfiltration happens over an encrypted C2 channel. So I thought that was pretty significant. So if you're looking at some sort of net network detection rule or web proxy, and it has the ability to do some sort of SSL decryption easily, like Zscaler is a one-click button. It's really, really nice. For the other NDR solutions, sometimes you do have to add you know, another certificate. So, But if it's easily implemented, it's something that CISA is recommending. Monitor clear text traffic for unusual activities, you know, stuff that's over port 80, any type of unencrypted LDAP communication, that's a huge issue. If you still have unencrypted LDAP um, traffic, you know, try to move to LDAP-S or even a hosted solution 
over the cloud. You can do LDAP to a cloud solution as well, an IDP. And then deploy some sort of DLP or information protection. And we had an episode with Rachel a few weeks ago, O'Shea, who is our compliance technical specialist. She talked about information protection and DLP and the ability to scan documents for sensitive information and, and it can trigger on that. And there's other DLP solutions out there that you can go with. Netscope's big in the space, and um, Zscaler has a DLP solution as well. So, you know, whoever you go with, I think it's important to have some sort of DLP solution in place for post-breach to at least detect and then prevent that information from getting exfiltrated. So IDS, IDP, or sorry, IDS, IPS, having one of those in place, kind of like a signature-based antivirus where it's still going to catch kind of the obvious stuff and that's not a bad thing. So still worth having in place. I, I thought your call out on NDR is good and there is still value there for sure. SSL decryption, I'm going to I'm gonna go on board and say I don't like it. I I don't like putting anything out there that's super attractive to attackers as it is. And, you know, I've heard all sorts of assurances like, oh, well, we do that, but we automatically discard credentials that are like for banks or credit unions or whatever. Like that means if you do that, then you have built logic in where that traffic gets decrypted and it goes through some sort of logic engine that runs in CPU and runs in memory and then makes the decision to discard it. So there is still processing that happens before it gets discarded, which means if I'm an attacker and I can insert myself early enough in that process, now I can start sniffing your user's bank credentials if they're going to their bank and checking their balance or something. I mean, there are risks galore with this. And you've already instructed all your client machines to essentially not prompt because they have that self-signed certificate or whatever you've put on there. So they're not going to get any notification in their web browser if the bad guys somehow insert themselves in that process. I just think the benefits don't outweigh it. This is already way down the kill chain in the exfiltration phase, which means you're already owned. They've already gotten the payload and now they're just trying to get it out. I don't, I don't agree with weakening and putting all of your passwords and all of your user credentials in plain text, even if it discards it later um, and having that attractive source of, fountain of data for attackers to potentially go after. Don't make it that easy for them. Make them work harder to get that sort of thing than just doing it yourself. My goodness. I, I just don't see the benefit. And I get, you know, with the data that Andy, you said over 60% of attackers use an encrypted C2 channel to exfiltrate data. I get that you are leaving a gap here because if you don't look at it, you have a lack of visibility, which means you can't stop it. I understand all that, but I think the potential downsides are way too risky here. And I, I have yet to hear a compelling argument that makes it outweigh it in my own mind. So that's my opinion, not the opinion of anyone else. Obviously, I'll disagree with CISA on this one, but I do do not like SSL decryption at all. Uh, data loss prevention tools, love them. Love them in a defense in depth strategy with information protection. Do both. Have a solution that scans for documents and data that is attempting to leave your environment, whether that's through the cloud or through your endpoints. And if it detects something that shouldn't be leaving, stop it from leaving. That's great. Information protection is an added benefit because now not only are you blocking all the exits, but you actually have the protection on the file. And so even if, again, it gets past kind of your blockade of your DLP solution, it's still protected even past that. So Defense in depth. We love defense in depth on this show, and that's an example of that. So lots of good stuff here. Lots of interesting discussion for sure. And my final thought is, you know, we, we talked about picking and choosing and implementing things as much as possible. And I just thought back to that episode that we did, Adam, about that one security article that was written that caused all that drama within the InfoSec community mm -hmm. and how that professor thought that best practices weren't really doing their job and not, and to say that the best practices aren't good. And I think, you know, again, best practices, 
are what they are. I think they're good, and we went through a, a list of them. But the problem with the industry is that most people can't implement them 100%. Like if we went through this list and you're able to knock out 100% and do this for everything, then you're probably going to be pretty secure, but nothing is foolproof. Mm-hmm. Like you're never going to get 100% of you know risk mitigation. So there's always going to be some sort of risk factor and there's going to be people who agree to disagree. Like Adam, we went through this list and there were a couple of things that you actually disagreed with the guidance on with uh, for CISA. So each person, each organization is going to need to make their own evaluation based on their organization, based on the risk that they're willing to accept. And you take this quote unquote guidance from CISA with a grain of salt and you do your own evaluation and you implement it. And like I said, all, all the stuff is basic, but even this list here that we talked about, no one's going to be able to implement it 100%. So use the guidance, but implement as much as you can based on your risk profile. Yeah, it, it, perfectly said, Andy. We're just kind of going through a lot of this guidance because it's driv- it's data-driven here. CISA has gone through and done these evaluations and has learned from them what the most common methodologies are throughout the kill chain. And then the mitigations are kind of tied to that, where if we do these mitigations, we can reduce the risk of this, which is the most common. So that's why we recommend doing it. So this is really data-driven. It's aligned to real-world activity and what's actually been seen out there in the real world. So there's a ton of value here. And the reason why we bring it up on this show for our defenders or blue hat wearers is if you've had trouble implementing something in the past, if you can revisit it, you can go to the show notes and pull down the CISA report. There's a really nice infographic with some really nice bar charts and it's a very visual document. So it's even something you can put in front of a business decision maker and say, hey, I understand you've asked for us to accept this risk in the past or for you to accept this risk. But I want you to understand that here's the United States federal government who has looked at multiple scenarios and determined that this is 60% of the way the bad guys get in or something. And here's why we want to take that mitigation step. And I understand you've not been interested in that in the past, but I want to make sure you have a full understanding of the data and know that it's not just me saying this, but here's a trusted source of information that might change your mind or might help you rethink your approach to this risk. And if we've done that, if we've helped one org or one blue hat help have a more informed conversation and maybe change the hearts and minds of the folks they're working with, then I think that's a win for everyone. We've lifted the bar for security. And so that's what I think a lot of today's conversation was about. We all know the basics, but sometimes it's nice to have a conversation remapping those to the real world challenges that we're trying to address. That's our show for this week. Thanks for listening. Our contact information will be in the show notes if you guys want to reach out with comments or topics you want us to talk about. Thanks, and we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAW0 and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.